So today we'll be talking about chapter eight, which is total parenteral nutrition. The abbreviation of total parenteral nutrition is TPN. And in this chapter, we'll be going over the following objectives. So at the end of this lecture, you should be able to discuss the conditions in which total parental nutrition would be appropriate. And you should be able to list five goals of parental nutrition. You should be able to list the basic design of a TPN solution and the purpose of each component. And you should also be able to perform necessary techniques that's required to prepare a TPN solution. So now that I've gone over the objectives, let's get into an, introdu an introduction of what TPN is. So the TPN, which again is abbreviated as Total Parenteral Nutrition, uh, it is the nutritional balance um, that coincides with the nutrients that a person should have. So it's essential to understand the proper techniques and goals of the TPN. So one of the reasons for it is it to prevent harm and it's also to provide proper uh, the proper amount of calories that's required for a specific patient. So a patient that might be taking a TPN uh, might be someone who is malnutrition. Uh, they may have um, have had an injury and they may need a TPN to help uh, restore some of the electrolytes. So there are some considerations uh, regarding when and who should use a TPN. So I mentioned before, uh, it's a nutritional imbalance. TPNs is gonna help with that. So for it's also for patients who cannot take in adequate amounts of nutrients through the GI tract, GI standing for gastrointestinal. And so some of the people who might need a TPN might include people who have certain diseases or conditions, people who are going through surgery or people who have gone through trauma. So like a, a bad injury or something. Um, there are some nutritional requirements when it comes to TPNs and they can vary. So the common range of TPNs ranges from uh, 2,500 to, to 3,000 calories per day while on TPN therapy and it's mostly supplied in two to three liters of fluid daily. And so if you know how many milliliters is in one liter, how many would be in two to three liters? That would be the same based on the common range, uh, two to 3,000 liters of, I mean, two to 3,000 milliliters of fluid. So now that I've gone over uh, some of the reasons why a person may consider a TPN, let's continue to learn some more uh, reasons. So inside of the TPN, you have different egg mixtures. So it's going to be an IV egg mixture, which can be individually designed to meet either a patient's nutritional requirements that's either based on their disease or their condition. Uh, with the IV egg mixtures, which is known as TPNs, um, the IV egg mixtures must be prepared using the highest quality of a septic technique, which is going to help by preventing the spread of any bacteria that may be passed to an already critically ill or susceptible patient. So it's important when performing and creating the TPNs that the aseptic technique is practiced, making sure that the environment continues to be sterile and that there are going to be uh, no contamination. Also for the IV mixtures, these can be very complex and they consist of many calculations and manipulations. So uh, some of the things that's added to a TPM might be uh, some different components like carbohydrates or some fats or some lipids and some proteins. And there are gonna be different measurements of those that's gonna be given to the patient. So those have to be calculated differently. And we'll go into a little bit about those uh, as we continue in this chapter. So, the primary goal of parental nutrition is it's going to help replace the nutritional deficits. It's going to help promote the wound healing. It's going to increase or diminish the rate of weight loss. Also, it's going to prevent protein or um, caloric malnutrition. Uh, so with uh, the TPNs, it should be administered to patients who are malnutrition or who have the potential of becoming malnutrition. And it's often a good candidate um, that has multiple problems in TPN therapy often follows a surgery or a procedure where food intake might be inhibited. So 
with the goals of the TPN is going to help sustain the nutritional balance during the periods when, during the periods where somebody might can't take anything by mouth like an enteral feeding or it might not be possible or sufficient for them to take anything by mouth. So as we continue learning about uh, the purposes and the considerations for TPNs, uh, one of the reasons why a TPN might be administered might be to again help someone who's malnutrition or uh, those who are potential with malnutrition, and that could be people who have some chronic weight loss. Anytime you hear chronic, you should think of long term. Uh, anytime you hear the word acute, A-C-U-T-E, that means short term. So a person who's dealing with chronic weight loss means they continually are losing weight. So that person might have to be on a TPN. Uh, people who have chronic vomiting or diarrhea, Again, chronic means long lasting. So a person who's continually um, vomiting up fluids or having constant diarrhea, they might be given a TPN so that it would restore uh, their nutrition. Um, there are some conditions that require their, bo their bowels to reset, I mean to rest, and some conditions that require the bowels to rest would include pancreatitis and um, peritonitis. And so with pancreatitis, that's the inflammation of the pancreas. And with perinitis, that's infl the inflammation of the lining of the abdominal cavity. So understanding anytime you see the word itis at the end of a word, it's a suffix, which the suffix itis means inflammation. So anytime you see itis at the end of a word, you'll know it's going to be inflammation of something, just so you know. So that's one of the medical words. Uh, continuing with uh, reasons or things that a person should consider when taking a, a TPN, a person who has severe burns might be on a TPN because they're, they're unable to take anything by mouth. So that might be something that might be given to them to help them with balancing their nutrition. So in continuing talking about uh, things being balanced, uh, with the TPN, there is a balance of nitrogen in the blood, which is essential to keep the balance of protein. So negative nitrogen uh, balance is the indicator that the protein tissue is being broken down faster than being replaced. And in malnutrition, uh, the body converts the protein to glucose for energy. And so anytime the protein is converted to glucose, uh, glucose meaning sugar. So now that we talked about some special consideration, let's next talk about the components uh, in the solution when it comes to preparing egg mixtures. So some components when it comes to TPNs is going to be the energy source. And so you have the base or the macronutrients. The base or the macronutrients is going to be the carbohydrate, the protein, or the fat. Now, when it comes to the carbohydrate, uh, the major function of the carbohydrate is to provide energy. So the most common intravenous source for carbohydrates is glucose. So that might be why you hear people often say, oh, I need to have me a candy bar so I can kind of get some sugar. That's not the best carbohydrate, but I get it. You know, if they have really low sugar, them eating a candy bar is really going to uh, increase their sugar, which is going to give them some type of energy. So again, the major function of carbohydrates is that it provides energy. Now, we mentioned that the most common IV source is glucose. So an example for how can glucose be administered, uh, that is going to be provided as dextrose in a parenteral solution. So that's why anytime you see dextrose, you're going to know that's the sugar, aka the glucose. So with carbohydrates, they provide, um, it's a completely bioavailable for the body without the effects of malabsorption. So in continuing, also talking about uh, the carbohydrates, we're going to learn about the peripheral parenteral nutrition. And so this would have to do with the 10% dextrose. So 10% dextrose, the abbreviation for that would be D10W, which would mean it's 10% of dextrose and water. So with this, it has a higher concentration that should be given through a peripheral vein. It should not be used more than seven to 10 days. So therefore it's only used for a short-term therapy. So it wouldn't be, it would not be used for long-term therapy and the peripheral parenteral nutrition. 
uh, such as the 10% dextrose, is for those whose normal GI functions would resume in about three or four weeks. So that's why we say it's not going to be for a long-term therapy. It's only going to be used for short-term short, short -term therapy. Now for the TPNs, uh, when carbohydrates are used, it's usually about 20 to 70 percent solution of dextrose that may be used, and it's usually administered through the central vein. So you may recall uh, when we learned about uh, when intravenous products are entered, we learned that they're either going to be entered through a central line or through a peripheral line. Now with the TPNs, um, they do provide calories for long-term therapy. And so with the carbohydrates, um, this would uh, be uh, the TPM would start gradually and then it will be tapered off. So gradually meaning, OK, they might increase it over time, but then when they taper it off, they're going to slowly but surely wean the person off of the TPN. Uh, whenever it gets uh, completed. Now, another thing to consider when it comes to carbohydrates is hypoglycemia. Uh, so hypoglycemia means low blood sugar. Hypo, the medical uh, word for low, is hypo. So anytime you hear hypo, that means low. Glycemia would represent the sugar. So hypoglycemia is low blood sugar. And this can occur if um, hypoglycemia can occur if the 20 to 70 percent dextrose is stopped abruptly. So that means if it's stopped really quickly. Now, hypoglycemia can occur. Um, hypoglycemia happens uh, because it's due to the imbalance of glucose in the body from the high concentration in solution. So TPNs, like I mentioned before, are gradually tapered are gradually and tapered off. So the 10% dextrose might be required to allow for the dextrose to level out. So if they start someone with a dextrose that's between uh, 20 to 70% in the TPN, when they gradually get ready to get that patient off of that TPN, they might give the 10% dextrose to level it out. So now that I've talked about carbohydrates as the component, we'll next talk about the fats or the lipids. So with the IV fats composition, um, an example of that would be uh, intravenous fats are primarily made up of safflower or uh, soybean oil, egg yolks, and even some glycerol to provide um, tonicity. So with the fats or lipids, uh, fat is the primary source of energy and heat. Uh, fat also provides twice as many energy calories per gram as either carbohydrates or proteins. Fats are also That's essential right. for That's all. Right. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but we can't. I don't think we can see the slides. They haven't been moving. I just didn't want to interrupt you. But okay, hold on. Let me see. Sorry, I know you've been. No, you guys have to tell me. <laughs> I know. I just didn't want to interrupt you. I'm so sorry y'all all the time when you see the first when you hear me keep going and you don't see nothing y'all gotta tell me so you don't see any of my slides moving well you're still in chapter eight the total parental nutrition so you're in slide one you have not passed okay. thank you mm -hmm. Let's see, so this, I was at the beginning of fats or lipids. So are you seeing my slides turn now? Well, you're starting fat or lipids. So if you go over to the next one, I'll let you know. Do you see proteins now? No, you're hmm. still in slide 14. Okay, hold on. Now I see slide 17. Yeah, I exited out. Let me try to see how we can get this. Hold on, you guys. Thank you. Okay. Are my slides changing? No. You are still in number seventeen, slide seventeen protein. 
All right, so I'll just I'll just uh, keep it from this angle then. I don't know why it's not letting me be great. <laughs> it's okay. We'll continue. Thank you. Um, so with fats and lipids, I talked about uh, fats being the primary source of energy and heat. Uh, it's also essential for the for all structural cell membrane integrity. Um, there's also an abbreviation EFAD, which stands for essential fatty acid deficiency, and this causes complications such as impaired wound healing, and it also increases the susceptibility to infections. So, uh, TPNs are going to uh, assist with making sure that the body has, you know, all of the components of what it needs. So when it comes to fat emotions, they are available in different forms. It could be available in a 10% uh, solution or um, a two point calorie uh, per milliliter in a 20% solution. And so the fat emotions are also inspected for separation. And it's important that the fat emotions are not used if there is yellowish streaking. So with the solutions uh, in fats, the solutions are known as, it can be known as the trade names as liposin, and they are a milky uh, white solution. So now that I've talked about the fats or lipids, uh, we'll next learn about the proteins. And with the proteins, those help the body build nutrients. They help by replacing the replacement of cells. Um, it helps with the tissue growth and repair. Now, proteins can be found in scar tissue, antibodies, and also clots. So with proteins, um, the amino acids are the basic units of proteins, and these are what's used in the TPN solution. So with the amino acids, um, it's a basic unit of proteins, and it comes in three to 15%, and it can also come with or without electrolytes. Now you might be thinking, so I've heard about carbohydrates, I've heard about fats and lipids, I've heard about proteins. Okay, so what about carbohydrates? I mean, so what about electrolytes? So with electrolytes, electrolytes is going to help with the long-term therapy of TPNs because it requires basic electrolytes. Now, the basic electrolytes include potassium, sodium chloride, calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. Now, it's approximately 20, excuse me, it's approximately 30 to 40 milliequivalents of potassium, which is needed for each 1,000 calories provided parenterally. So anytime you see MEQ, it's important to know that that means the miller equivalent. So it's another strength of uh, medication. So in learning about the electrolytes, we're learning that there are some other electrolyte amounts that's needed as well. And that can be with calcium gluconate or chloride, which would come in 10 to 15 milliequivalents in 24 hours, or sodium chloride or acetate, which would come in 60 to 100 milliequivalents in 24 hours. And this helps by maintaining the acid base balance. So when it comes to electrolytes, there's a transport of glucose and amino acids that goes across the cell membranes. And this includes with potassium phosphate, potassium acetate, and potassium chloride. It's important to know all three of these are different. So when choosing a potassium, you wanna make sure that you choose the right one. So you have potassium phosphate, potassium acetate, and potassium chloride. Also, the abbreviation for potassium is KCL. So anytime you see KCL, you know that that means potassium. So in continuing to learn about the electrolytes when it comes to uh, the components, the electrolytes are compounded and they're calculated specifically for each TPN, which goes according to the following, the blood levels, the acid base 
uh, balances and also the disease states. So based on what the person is being treated for, the TPN is going to be structured based on that. So now that we've talked about electrolytes, we'll next learn about vitamins. So with vitamins, um, those are helpful for people who are dealing with um, certain diseases or conditions because it can alter the amount that's available in the body. Now with the vitamins, um, there is a deficiency. If there is a vitamin deficiency, this can cause death in a critically ill patient. So certain uh, vitamins that could be entered into a TPN would include vitamin K or um, phytonodion, uh, which is found in lipids, but it does not require additional injections if it's received in total parenteral admixture. So um, also with the vitamins, Uh, some vitamins don't have to require, as I mentioned, additional uh, injections if they receive everything that's needed in the TPN. So now that we talked about vitamins, we'll next learn about the trace elements. And so with the trace elements, you have a micro element and that's found in the body in minute amounts. And so each single chemical has its own deficiency state. And so zinc aids, um, would help with wound healing and then copper and iron would aid in hemoglobin activity hemoglobin meaning the blood and so with the micro elements with this would be available in a single vial and then it can be added to a tpn and you have some other elements when it comes to trace elements uh such as selenium which are important in the production of antioxidants um, while fluorine and nickel are necessary for proper bone and teeth formation so now that i've gone over some examples of trace elements we'll talk about some other additives that could be included so you have some other medications that's specific to a patient that might be necessary some examples might be insulin uh, heparin and a histamine 2 receptor inhibitor so the insulin is going to help patients who are diabetic Heparin is going to help patients who are on uh, blood thinning and uh, they may have clots. And then the histamine 2 uh, is going to help with people who have some GI problems or might even have ulcers. So how do we prepare a TPN? Well, all calculations or research that's required to make the TPN is going to happen in the ante room. Now, the ante room means the before room, so it's going to be the room where uh, the aseptic hand washing is going to happen, where we would make sure that there is proper hand hygiene that's being performed, uh, proper garbing and gowning. Garbing would include putting on the lap, uh, putting on the gloves, uh, putting on the uh, hair bonnet and the shoe covers, and then the gowning would include putting on the lap coat. So in, administ so in administering the TPNs, uh, we also have the buffer area. Buffer area will be another name for the clean room. And so inside of the clean room, you will want to also make sure that you spray your hands with 70% alcohol or disinfect it, and you always want to allow it to dry. And you can even spray your gloves with uh, alcohol and allow it to dry. And then you should always perform cleaning procedure for the laminar airflow workbench. Uh, because any time that you prepare a CSP, which is a compounded sterile preparation, or any time you prepare a TPN, you should always clean your laminar airflow hood. So inside of the buff area, as we continue, uh, you will want to gather your supplies in the direct compounding area, better known as the DCA. And then you always want to make sure that you decontaminate your items. So you would spray or wipe the surface with the 70% isopropyl alcohol. The abbreviation for isopropyl alcohol is IPA. And you'll want to remove any outer packaging at the edge of the DCA as it enters into the aseptic workspace. And this is going to help with removing dust particles and any other contaminants. So as a person is preparing a TPN, uh, they would attach the syringe inside of the DCA, making sure that there is um, no contact with contamination or an interruption of the first air. They'll also want to make sure that they disinfect all of the uh, critical sites using IPA wipes. 
the 70%. And then before anything is used, they need to wait at least 10 seconds. And this ensures that everything has been dry, drawn off, um, dried off. So uh, at the end of this, I'll probably even try to share a video with you guys so you can kind of get an idea to see what all of these procedures would look like. So when a TPN is being created, the first base is made. Uh, well, first the base is made and it's going to consist again of the macronutrients, which could include the amino acids, the dextrose and the fat or the lipids. Now, some, P some TPNs could call for the lipids to be infused separately. Now, the order of the mixing is important. And so basically, uh, the dextrose and the fat should not be directly combined. Now, when the TPN is mixed, there is also called a gravity method. And so with the gravity method, uh, each component is spiked and this has a special empty bag that holds either two or three liter, two or three liters. So think of all of the bags that you need that holds the components of, um, you know, the carbohydrates, the fats, the lipids, the protein, and then an empty bag is there so that all of the components from those um, other bags can come through to there. And this allows the fluid of each source to enter into the empty bag. And so this is called the TPN. And this is where the fluids are transferred into the bag by hanging them up. This is the gravity method and it allows for the calculated amounts to flow into an empty bag. So when it comes to the person who makes it, think of the compounders, um, which may be used to make the base. So you have some automated machines um, that can make a TPN, but it's still the technician that would make sure that all of the fluids are going towards the empty bag. And this, uh, the compound, the compounders would allow the fluids to be measured by specific gravity, and it's also programmable. So with the compounders, there are some advantages to having that. Uh, some of the advantages would be that it's faster. It also has less le less touch contamination because it's hooked up to the machine. Um, it's better accuracy because it's programmable. Um, the pharmacist can input the order and then they can also generate a label automatically. Uh, each bag is given a number uh, based on what's being used. Um, it can also sit directly inside of the laminar airflow hood workbench. And then it's a technician that can also monitor the process. So because um, it's programmable, it could also have a better advantage. Um, so now that I've talked about the TPNs and its components and the compounders that would help it be programmable, we'll next talk about some micronutrients. So once a base is prepared, it could be it could be placed on the side of the DCA. And there are some other ingredients or micronutrients that can be introduced into the DCA. And anytime that happens, it should be individually drawn up. And that amount can vary from either 1 to 14. Now, if the gravity method is used, uh, remember, uh, gravity method is where um, the IV bag um, can be placed upside down. Um, if that method is used, uh, it will be gathered and staged in the LAFW, uh, the laminar airflow hood workbench in proper order so that the micronutrients can flow properly uh, into the TPN. So with micronutrients, uh, it refers to printed information for incapabilities and compatibilities and the, also the order of mixing. And if it's automated, the compounder uh, is available for adding micronutrients and a procedure if it's different. And remember, it can be programmed to add more. So if something's already made, more can be added to it. So with the micronutrients, you also have a home therapy and it's a pharmacy technician that will prepare a TPN at a home infusion facility. They have uh, several of them around the city. Uh, the home therapy can be delivered in home in a home health nurse will be the one that administers the solution uh, via an infusion pump using an infusion pump. So as I complete talking about TPNs and how uh, they are created, lastly, we'll talk about some special considerations. And so there is a decreasing risk of precipitation that forms in the TPN solution. 
So with TPNs, they should be refrigerated or used um, immediately. Um, now, after it's hung, it should be infused or discarded within 24 hours. Um, all TPNs should be filtered with the 0.2 micron filter. And this is going to make sure that no particles larger than that is going to be going into the patient. And before infusion, it should always be warm to room temperature for at least one hour. Lastly, in learning about um, some special considerations, the patient care should include, you know, making sure that they have daily weights, seeing how much the patient weighs, uh, their signs, their vital signs should always be checked. Um, and then they should usually always have uh, various lab values every four to six hours. And if the TPN is stopped abruptly, there is a bag of dextrose 10% that should be administered at the same rate until the patient's status can be evaluated. Because remember, sometimes when it comes to uh, the TPN therapy, if, if the TPN stops, they should never just stop abruptly. And if so, they're going to need to change it to a bag of 10% dextrose. That way it's not too much of a shock to the patient system since they're being leveled out. So when it comes to labeling, uh, all of the ingredients that's being used in the TPN should be on there. Uh, the amounts that's being added to the bag, the expiration date, the infusion rate, that means how many milliliters the person is going to receive each hour, and then the proper signatures needs to be on the TPN, and that's um, is going to include uh, the doctor's signature, and then, you know, uh, who's ordered it. And so it's important that with the TPNs, strict, the strictest accepted techniques should be followed. And this is due to the complexity of the TPN order because of the amounts of additives. Remember, you're adding like multiple things to it. So you always want to avoid potential infections to critically ill patients. And the more manipulations that are needed, it's the higher the risk of contamination. Because if you are adding, you know, six or several different things to a TPN, that's many times for something to be contaminated. So the more manipulations that's needed, the higher the risk of contamination. So technicians should be extremely cautious when calculating the amounts of the additives, as well as observing um, proper technique and the storage requirements of the TPM. So listed here is an example of what a TPM would look like. Uh, you would see the amino acids that would be wanted. So I'm using figure 8.1. So this is a sample TPN order. And so if you can look closely, let me see if I can kind of get this a little closer. If you can look closely, uh oh, if you can look closely, you'll see that the person is going to have 10% of amino acids. So based on this order uh, that the doctor has ordered, they want 425 milliliters of 10% amino acids. The prescriber wants 70% dextrose. Um, they want 357 milliliters of that, and then they want 20% of lipids. They want 125 milliliters of the 20% lipids. And then the final volume, they want quantity sufficient sterile water for injection, at least 400 milliliters because they want a total volume of uh, 1,248 milliliters. So this is just an example of what a TPM order would look like, and they'll say how many milliliters that needs to be added. Now, if it's an additional additive that needs to be added to it, you'll see over here on the right-hand side, um, this person also has some humulin mixed to it. That's an insulin. And so they want 10 units daily. And then it looks like they also want a multivitamin included, and they want 10 milliliters of that. And then you have here the other different vitamins. So this is just an example of all of the milliliters of the medicine, or should I say the strengths of the medicine that they want. So you have the vitamins, you have the carbohydrates, you have the proteins, and then they let you know down here what the infusion rate is. So to check the infusion rate,
it looks like they want it for 12 hours. So if you wanted to confirm to make sure they have the right infusion rate, the formula for flow rate is total volume, which the total volume based on this TPN is 1248. So you would do 1248 and then divide that by 12. 12 meaning the hours, and it lets you know their standard rate is 104 milliliters per hour. So on the next one, it also gives you an example of a TPN. So I want you to try seeing what its flow rate would be. So using your calculator, if they have a total volume of 1350 and they're infusing it over 12 hours, what would be their flow rate? So I'll even put that in the lab question. Um, so looking at the final volume, 1350. And looking at 12.5. Uh-huh. OK. Did everybody else get the same answer? I'm sorry, what did you say? I was asking if everybody also got the same answer. So looking at your TPM formula based on the final volume of 1350, if they're receiving this over 12 hours, what would be their IV flow rate? Was it um 100, 112.5? Yeah, that's what I got to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. This is explaining the um the, the critical thinking. Yeah, it was kind of like a uh what the critical thinking. You're kind of going over looking at their base formula. And what sections of the form the prescriber would have to fill out? Okay. So with the critical thinking, try making um, your own TPN. So you see some sections aren't checked and then some are. So it lets us know the infusion rate is going to be 83 milliliters per hour. Okay, so with the critical thinking, you should be able to tell me how many milliliters the person should have. So if they're receiving, and don't say it all out loud because I want everybody to figure it out. Um, so with your critical thinking question, um, looking at the infusion schedule, it tells you the person is receiving 83 milliliters per hour. And then it lets you know the person is basically, based on number four, the person is receiving it over 12 hours. So you could tell me how many milliliters the person is going to be given in a total volume. Don't say it online. Tell me when you uh, answer the critical thinking question um, and then you would email it back to me. So they're taking 83 milliliters each hour and based on the IV therapy, it says that they're taking it over 12 hours. So you can know based on that how many uh, I guess you could say how many IV bags would be given based on that based on those values. And that's going to complete chapter eight.